Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining the C2AS webinar, Climate Disclosure, Transparency as a Corporate Strategy. I am Tom Erb, a Policy Fellow at C2AS, and I'm pleased to be hosting this conversation with you all today. Thank you first to our panelists for taking the time to be with us. Thank you also to our audience for tuning in and contributing to the discussion. From the entire C2AS team, we wanna start by wishing everyone good health and safety during these difficult times. C2AS, as we all have, has been adjusting to our new reality and will continue to find ways to engage on these important issues while also responding to the immediate health crisis. On that point, I do apologize if there's any background noise on my end. There's an ongoing construction outside my home office and more importantly, an ongoing first grade math lesson happening at the other end of my apartment. So thank you for your patience and understanding. Next slide, please. Joining me on the webinar today are three corporate leaders in the disclosure space. Sharon is the Senior Manager of Global Sustainability and ESG at General Motors Company. Mackenzie is the Vice President for Sustainable Finance at J.P. Morgan Chase. And Michael is the Vice President for Environment, Land, and Government Affairs at Lafarge Wholesome. I'm looking forward to hearing from each of you here shortly. Before we dive into the content, here are a few housekeeping items. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted on our C2ES YouTube page following this broadcast. And after presentations, we'll have ample time for audience Q&A. Using your GoToWebinar question box, you can submit questions throughout the webinar. The question function should be on the right-hand side of your webinar screen. Next slide, please. To begin, here is our plan. I'm going to kick things off with a brief introduction, some background on C2ES, and a short presentation on our new brief on the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures. Each panelist will then give a short presentation about their approach to climate disclosure. And after all presentations are complete, I will lead with a few moderator questions while we collect audience questions. We will then have time for audience Q&A at the end of the session. Next slide, please. So a little bit about C2ES. We are an independent and nonpartisan nonprofit organization focused on strong policy and action to address climate change. Our core mission is to forge practical solutions to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, expand clean energy, and strengthen resilience to climate impacts. We are known as the convener of stakeholders. That means federal, state, and local governments, as well as corporations and other NGOs. And we produce publications on topics including carbon pricing, climate resilience, and international climate negotiation. For example, in early March, we hosted our annual climate leadership conference, which brought together hundreds of influential climate energy and sustainability professionals to share cutting edge carbon and energy practices and business solutions to our climate challenge. I'd also recommend looking into our Climate Innovation 2050 project. Through the project, C2AS has released background briefs focused on decarbonizing various US sectors, a report that presents and draws insights from three alternative scenarios for decarbonizing the US economy, and Getting to Zero, a US Climate Agenda a major report outlining the policies needed over the coming decades to put the United States on a path to carbon neutrality. Throughout this entire process, we've collaborated with more than three dozen leading companies. So I encourage you to check out our website where you can find reports, events, blogs, and some great reference material. We're always looking for new ways to collaborate and support climate policy efforts. So feel free to contact me with your ideas. Back to the topic of the day. Next slide, please. One of our unique features is that we have a Business Environmental Leadership Council, or BELC, as we call it. The BELC includes top companies in electric power, manufacturing, transportation, high-tech, oil and gas, and finance sectors. It is one of the largest U.S.-based group of companies devoted solely to addressing climate change. One of the benefits of the BELC is that it is multi-sectoral. So unlike a trade association, companies can talk to other companies outside of their industry on climate policy and climate strategy. And a lot of our stakeholder work involves engaging this group of companies with others to try to move the needle on climate action, including on climate risk and disclosure. Next slide, please. Okay, so here's some background information for those who are new to climate risk and disclosure. As the impacts of climate change become more severe, companies, investors, consumers, and governments are increasingly concerned about the risks these impacts pose to our economic and financial systems. These risks are both physical such as supply chain interruptions from severe weather events and transitional, 
such as higher carbon prices leading to increased operating costs and early retirement. The topic today is disclosure. Clear and transparent reporting of climate-related risks to ensure that companies can prepare for climate impacts and investors and other stakeholders can make smart investment decisions based on these risks. Of course, it is more complex than that, but that will give you a good starting point if you're new to this. As of now, companies are currently reporting these risks in a plethora of ways. In fact, nearly 400 mandatory and voluntary frameworks for climate and sustainability disclosure exist. These include corporate sustainability reports, financial filings, and various voluntary reporting frameworks, including CDP, the Global Reporting Initiative, and the PRI. What is missing is consistency and quality assurance to these disclosures. Next slide, please. In response to this challenge, in 2015, G20 finance ministers and central bank governors asked the Global Financial Stability Board, or FSB, to review how the financial sector can better anticipate and respond to the implications of climate change. FSB then launched the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, or TCFD, to develop a comprehensive set of recommendations to guide voluntary disclosures on financial filings. The TCFD's recommendations were released in June 2017. I'm not going to go into detail of these recommendations, but you can find them online. Instead, during this session, we're going to focus on a few questions. Where are we with TCFD implementation and what are the lessons learned? What challenges remain and how do we overcome them? How is disclosure related to companies' overall climate strategy? And who is taking disclosure to the next level? Next slide, please. C2ES has been working hard with partner companies on climate disclosure for the last three years. In 2017, C2ES released the brief Beyond the Horizon Corporate Reporting on Climate Change, which reviews the types of climate-related risks and takes a closer look at the TCFD recommendations, including where companies need additional support to implement the recommendations. In August 2018, C2ES released the brief Best Practices and Challenges Using Scenarios to Assess and Report Climate-Related Financial Risk. We also have a webinar online covering this topic. Last year, in 2019, C2ES hosted two workshops to further support corporate disclosure efforts. And just last month, we hosted a session similar to this webinar at our Climate Leadership Conference in Detroit. We'll use some of our takeaways, we'll use some of the takeaways from that session for the conversation today. Next slide, please. And today, we are releasing our latest brief, Implementing TCFD Strategies for Enhancing Disclosure. So this brief was produced using the best practices, challenges, and lessons learned during the C2ES workshops held in 2019. We'd like to thank Bank of America and J.P. Morgan Chase for their support of the workshops and the brief. The 2019 workshops focused on helping companies translate information gathered from climate scenario analysis into information that can be used for corporate decision making, and also assessing and disclosing the risks of physical climate impacts. The brief covers topics including the further assessment of physical climate risk, preparing for scenario analysis, and TCFD reporting. The full brief is available on the C2ES website, but for now, here are a few of the high-level takeaways. First, successful TCFD implementation requires coordination across multiple corporate functions. What this means is that since the TCFD framework focuses on financial outcomes, it has helped broaden climate change discussions beyond just corporate sustainability teams, to also include legal, finance, risk management, and systems planning units. Second, companies can build executive buy-in by broadening their analysis to reveal business opportunities rather than focusing solely on risk. Focus on business growth opportunities could help to engage senior leadership teams and create an opportunity to develop a comprehensive corporation-wide climate risk initiative. Third, stress testing modeling outcomes allows companies to better anticipate potential rough points in a transition. This is because most models used for scenario analysis assume gradual transition, in this case, an energy transition. However, financial impacts are most likely to occur during times of disruption, such as if game-changing technologies emerge or major climate policy is enacted. In addition to these insights, the brief also looks at some of the remaining challenges. For example, more work is needed to communicate the financial benefit of climate resilience investments. Resilience can have soft benefits that are realized over a long period of time, such as preventing damages from future climate change events. These make those benefits difficult to define, measure, and report. Second, 
companies are struggling to balance shareholder demands for more quantitative disclosures, like estimated property risk, with the range of outcomes and uncertainty that scenario analyses yield. So far, rather than report specific numbers, many companies are reporting on strategies that would be robust under a range of possible scenarios. Going forward, companies and shareholders must, must develop a shared understanding and tolerance for the uncertainty surrounding any risk quantification. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna stop there in the introduction, uh, but make sure to check out the brief and pass along any feedback or questions that you have. Next slide, please. Okay, now to our main event. I apologize for some of the technical difficulties there. Uh, if, there's a, if you have any questions about the C2ES work or the introduction, feel free to contact us and we'll get you that information as quickly as possible. We're now going to start the presentation. And today we're going to start with Sharon, who as mentioned, is the Senior Manager of Global Sustainability and EFG at General Motors Company. Sharon, please proceed with your presentation and I will set the stage with the question, how is GM disclosing and why are you taking this particular approach? Thank you very much. Hello? Hi, Sharon. Yes, we can hear you now. Okay. So can you go to the uh, first slide, please? So I, I just wanted to make a point that, you know, the, the title of this webinar is about um, uh, disclosure and transparency as a corporate strategy and ironically that's exactly how um, General Motors views our reporting um, and disclosures um, as really part of our overall strategy um, not only in uh, communicating our performance uh, to our goals and to um, other expectations uh, but also as a really strategic uh, communication uh, mechanism in uh, the process of engaging our investors and our key stakeholders. Go to the next slide, please. I just want to give a little bit of background on reporting. I think it answers one of your questions. Um, this it, it kind of encompasses all of the reporting frameworks and standards that we use to uh, communicate what we're doing um, on uh, climate and the impacts of climate. Um, we've been a forever long GRI reporter following those standards we report. Uh, at the comprehensive level there. Uh, we're a UN Global Compact signatory since 2015. Um, our reporting is encompassed in our communication uh, in, on progress uh, to the UNGC. Um, we have been reporting to the SASB standards. Uh, this will be the third um, report uh, that we issue in the next couple of months. Um, the same uh, with TCFD, um, this will also be the, the third. We've been reporting our climate uh, impacts and climate data uh, through CDP climate change uh, for almost 10 years now. And, um, and then uh, we do reference um, uh, climate and, and identify with certain um, sustainable development goals in terms of um, uh, tying our progress uh, to uh, those certain goals. Um, a, a lot of what we have done is really based on the fact that we value uh, disclosure and transparency and have for a really long time. Uh, not just in our uh, sustainability reporting, though that is um, our main focus, uh, but also uh, for consistency throughout all of our public disclosures. Um, certainly a lot uh, in recent years is being driven by the capital markets um, and investors, um, but we, we value that opportunity to be clear on our position 
on climate change, uh, our, our position and management approach um, as a business and how it's tied uh, directly to our corporate strategy and um, what the priorities of the company are. You can go to the next slide, please. About three years ago, we uh, announced um, our vision and aligned our corporate strategy uh, to this vision that has three pillars, um, a world with zero crashes, uh, working to a world uh, with zero emissions, and working um, for an environment of zero congestion. So the disclosures in the reporting, particularly on climate, align with this vision, and these goals are all interrelated. Um, in terms of, and, and our reporting and disclosures on climate and our climate impacts um, and the impact of climate on the company um, really are part of our roadmap to realizing this vision of zero crashes, zero emissions, and zero congestion. You can go to the next slide, please. Another advantage, I think, also for uh, General Motors, um, and certainly it, it has taken time uh, to really uh, develop, uh, is the strong uh, governance structure we have around ESG uh, that's in place today. Um, it, it really is what helps drive uh, all of this and all the consistency and uh, the disclosures that we do make and uh, the discussion and messages that we have around our climate impacts. And go to the next one. Um, the other thing is that uh, we, we do take a strategic approach um, and a proactive one uh, in looking at what our uh, disclosure on key issues are. Um, and, uh, and that is those issues that are raised by investors and key stakeholders. And you can see climate change for years has really been uh, one of the, the top ones. Uh, some of the other ones have come in uh, in more recent years, like in the last uh, two or three years. You can go to the next one. Our, another part of our proactive strategy is making it easy uh, for um, our key stakeholders and investors to get the information and, what, and our impact uh, in one uh, website. So uh, trying to build a location um, out there that is uh, the go-to uh, location for information regarding our climate impacts or all of our uh, impacts and management approach uh, to those uh, top issues um, for the company. Next one, please. And then even um, some of the, the challenges that uh, along the way on doing this is that um, there are areas where information is really sensitive or competitive um, in nature, but we seem to um, stay focused and find a way to discuss those issues. For instance, the findings from our scenarios analysis um, that we did as a part of our reporting with TCSD um, that um, had uh, definitely more, you know, corporate strategy elements to it, um, but we found a way to outlay uh, the results of that scenarios uh, analysis that we did as a cross-functional team um, in our reporting. So I, I would say that, to, you know, there is there are ways uh, to find uh, the ability to discuss and to disclose, um, not only um, in a strategic way, but a way that is um, uh, also protects uh, the confidentiality. Next one, please. And then our viewpoint is, um, we we prioritize consistency across all forms. So, you know, not only just the obvious ones like the sustainability report with the proxy and annual report, 
uh, in, but also investor presentations, our websites, and other things like recruiting sites, our supplier sites. So um, what we're disclosing on climate and, um, and other ESG uh, issues um, is consistent across um, all of our uh, communication and reporting. And then finally, uh, the next slide, please. A, a couple of practical steps uh, that we uh, really went through, you know, um, looking to the experts and the experience. Uh, when we started off in this, there weren't a lot of people that were already reporting. There were a lot of people that were looking at it, a lot of companies that were looking at it um, and trying to find, a, a, you know, their path forward. Um, but those that did or even just the discussions, uh, not only with other companies, but, uh, but with uh, NGOs and other experts really uh, began to um, show us, uh, you know, what the different possibilities were. Uh, in terms of how to disclose, what that looks like, who it needs to uh, involve, um, and uh, and some of the processes uh, to put in place um, for those disclosures. The second is um, engaging with investors and talk through what your approach is on uh, on climate risk and and better understand to have those conversations to better understand what information they find most useful and what their expectations are on disclosure. Um, and then um, third, it takes, uh, uh, it takes a village and really mainstreaming uh, disclosure on climate-related uh, aspects of the business and the impact um, really requires the uh, involvement of multiple functions, and I think that was already mentioned as a part of the C2ES um, uh, brief that's, uh, that's out today. And then finally, making a start of it and not letting the perfect get in the way of the good, and that I think is probably our, our most successful approach uh, in our climate disclosures. Uh, is that we we just got we just said we're going to get started because if we uh, and not worry about everything being perfect or actually even complete um, in uh, in the reporting and, and this approach was for both uh, SASB um, as well as TCFD uh, we felt it was more important to get some things out there and then uh, use that as an engagement point uh, with all the key stakeholders and including the organization uh, to learn more about how we can uh, make those disclosures more robust and useful along the way. So with this being our third year, um, more and more uh, robust and um, uh, thoughtful uh, disclosures um, will be out uh, this year more than last year and then obviously more than the year before. So don't let um, being perfect get out there. We do report this through our sustainability reporting rather than in our financial documents, but we are striving for that consistency across the board. I think we have some pretty good consistency between uh, our proxy and our sustainability reporting, um, and uh, and that is the way that uh, we chose to start. It's an iterative process, um, and uh, and you can over time um, improve on that and uh, make your disclosures uh, more robust and meet. Um, the key stakeholder needs. And that is what I have, Tom. I turn it back to you. Thank you so much, Sharon. That was really helpful. Uh, and I especially like the practical steps that you outlined there. I think that's a great place to start for a lot of companies. And I think uh, that's well reflected in the brief that we released as well. So we'll circle back to that in the Q&A. So we're now going to move to a presentation from Mackenzie. Mackenzie is the Vice President for Sustainable Finance at J.P. Morgan Chase. Mackenzie, please proceed with your presentation, and I will again set the stage with the question, how is J.P. Morgan Chase 
disclosing and why are you taking this particular approach? Thank you, Mackenzie. Please proceed. Thank you so much, Tom. Um, and I really appreciate the invitation to join the discussion today. Um, I'll start by giving you all a bit of context about how we approach climate and other environmental and social topics within our strategy. Um, and then we'll dive a little deeper into how that informs our approach toward climate related disclosure and then share a few insights on, on what we learned in that process. Um, so if you can change to the next slide. Thank you. Over the last few years, you know, we've seen a significant growing interest in expectations for companies to address environmental, social, and governance topics, especially climate. And I, you know, know we've covered this, and I know a lot of people know that. But just for context, you know, investors are looking for more disclosure and greater commitments. There's an increasing pressure on companies from nonprofits, community members, and public officials to address these issues. And, and increasingly, policymakers are turning their attention to these topics. For example, the EU's movement towards more stringent disclosure requirements. Uh, for us, and, and similar to what we just heard, disclosure is one part of our holistic sustainability strategy. We really work across the firm to embed sustainability into the way that we do business. And we report on this pro approach and what we're doing through a number of channels, including various reports, presentations, regulatory filings, ESG reporting, among others. And as we work through work to execute our strategy, we've really been asking ourselves kind of four big questions, especially over the last year or so. And that's, you know, how do we build more green opportunities? And this includes research and products and helping our clients meet their own sustainability goals. How can we support the transition to a lower economy? And this means working to better understand what the risks and opportunities are. Um, how can we run our operations more sustainably? And finally, how do we talk about all of this work? Um, and these questions have really guided how we have approached opportunities like the, the TCFD and, and, and climate disclosure broadly. Um, so if you can move to the next slide. Um, and I know that, you know, there's been a lot of information on the TCFD, so I won't dive too much. This is mostly for context. But Mark Carney and, and the work of the TCFD have really changed the way the industry approaches and talks about climate-related risk, which is really important. And we've been a member, we, a member of the TCFD since its inception. And we know that climate change presents risk to businesses and communities and that it was and is important to engage around these risks, um, especially now. And so being a part of the task force, we felt strongly about working to put out our own disclosure as quickly as possible. Um, and we were finally able to do that in May of 2019 when we re released our first report on understanding climate related risks and opportunities. That re report was informed by the TCFD recommendations. And it really outlines how we are approaching integrating these considerations into our governance, business strategy, and risk management efforts. Uh, that being said, you know, it is early and our report acknowledged that we have a lot of work to do to better understand what climate related factors, data and scenarios are needed to assess the risks and opportunities the firm and our clients potentially face. And as anyone tackling these topics knows, there are a number of challenges that we are all working through from data availability to questions around time horizons to sensitivities, among others. And so for us, our report was really a starting point something that we could build on and improve on over time as our understanding and capabilities improved. Um, and so I kind of just will round it out by kind of talking a little bit about what we learned. And so if you want to turn to the next slide. Next one. Um, you know, we learned a lot of things along the way that I thought would be useful for, for this conversation. And I'll just kind of briefly run through. Um, so some of this was touched on previously, but really to underscore, the first is that disclosure is about transparency. And as you're working through a question or starting on a journey, we found that talking about how you're getting somewhere is as important, or in some cases more important, depending on the question and the stage you're at, as it is to providing the conclusions that you reach. And we really came to this, you know, in conversations with stakeholders. You know, sometimes it's about communicating the hard questions you're asking yourself. And that's what people really want to know, especially as we're in this early stage. And it's also about being proactive. 
So if you don't tell your story and share what you're doing, others are likely to do that for you or assume you're not doing anything. Um, the second key insight that we came to was you really need good data to make good decisions. There's a lot of focus on this question right now, especially around defining and obtaining the right data. And it's incredibly important um, as we continue this journey to kind of refine that approach and, and continue to figure out what data do we need? What does it tell us? Third, it's important to think holistically about climate risk. And in a lot of ways, what we found is that climate change factors may not impact industries and even companies within the same industry the same. And so we really feel like as you report, quantitative metrics should always be accompanied by a qualitative narrative because giving the audience that you're reaching a sense of trends is arguably much more important than just a single snapshot and kind of contextualizing it in this broader conversation. Fourth, this one sometimes gets lost. And as we went through our journey, we found that that was true, which is that the opportunities are just as important as the risk. There are a lot of companies out there that are thinking strategically about the energy tr transition and focusing on solutions. And finding and supporting those opportunities is incredibly important um, and, and as important as also discussing the risk we face. Um, fifth, stakeholder engagement before and after disclosure is really key to productive conversations. And this was one that we found was really important both internally and externally. Um, you know, engaging with both internal and external audiences before and after is, was really key to us making progress. And we found that in the process of putting together our own report and, and talking about the climate disclosure, we really built some really interesting connections and relationships within the firm that were key to tackling these topics. And externally, it was equally important to engage with, with key stakeholders that wanted to use the information and to make sure that it was decision useful for what they needed it for. And lastly, uh, I'll just say it really is a journey as I think we all know, and there's a lot to be learned along the way. There are a lot of challenges that you find, especially as you start finding, um, start digging through, but you also find some really interesting solutions and ideas, um, and that's been really exciting for us. And with that, I'll turn it back to you, Tom. Thank you, Mackenzie. Very helpful, uh, very insightful. And again, thank you for laying out those steps and insights there. I think that's something we can circle back to in the Q&A. And just quickly before we proceed, just a reminder that if you have a question, make sure to submit it in the chat box. We won't be opening these, this up for the audience to ask their question verbally, but rather we're taking all of the questions in the chat box. So make sure to go there and submit your question. And we'll make sure we get to it. Okay, so we're gonna finish this webinar's presentations with Michael. Michael is the Vice President for Environment, Land, and Government Affairs at Lafarge Wholesome. So Michael, please proceed and I'll give you the same starting question. How is Lafarge Wholesome disclosing and why are you taking this particular approach? Please proceed. All right, so good afternoon, Tom. Um, I appreciate uh, <coughs> being included in the discussion along with Sharon and McKenzie, uh, two uh, fantastic thought leaders on this topic. <coughs> um, so. I like to, you know, I'd like to say, um, I'd like to start every every discussion I have with one of the advantages of participating in the webinar and kind of working remotely <clears throat> today is that um, I'd like to start with a very brief story. So I got up this morning at 5:30 Central, uh, took my cocker spaniel out. We went for a walk on the beach. <clears throat> it was beautiful. Um, the sun was coming up. It was kind of the fantastic morning. And then we had a whiteout snowstorm. So <clears throat> welcome welcome to living in the Midwest in Chicago, where I call home. So just a little bit of just a little bit of fun context, a um, little bit of the spirit of uh, working remotely when uh, I wouldn't have had that experience otherwise. <clears throat> so I appreciate uh, for Lafarge Holsom to be included in the uh, included in the discussion today. Um, for those that aren't familiar with uh, with our company, we're not. Uh, we're not a household name like General Motors in the U.S., but we are the largest construction materials, building materials company in the world. Uh, we're based out of Zurich, Switzerland. We operate in 80 countries, and I hold a position on the executive committee for our U.S. operations. Um, in the U.S., we are the number one producer of cement in the U.S., um, and uh, one, one in five 
building projects in the U.S. contains uh, contains our product. So just give you a little context on the company. What I would say as it relates to the topic that we're talking about today, uh, carbon uh, and climate disclosure has been part of the company's DNA for decades. <clears throat> Um, so we've we've been reporting um, for many many years on carbon um, carbon and climate um, goals as part of our sustainability reporting. <clears throat> and when we look at uh, sustainability reporting, we look at specifically climate, uh, energy, circular economy, environment, <clears throat> community, and biodiversity. So <clears throat> so the the broad we we look at it from a broader perspective, but climate being very Particular part of uh, particular part of our um, sustainability goals, and we have clearly defined and clearly articulated um, and clearly communicated uh, short-term and mid-term uh, goals as it relates to climate. And we have <clears throat> we have uh, very specific global goal uh, goals for CO2 reduction um, that relate to 2022 targets, as well as 2030 targets. And our 2030 targets include both scope one and scope two emissions. Um, from a from a perspective, a learning perspective, and a sharing perspective, you know, years ago we helped found the World Business Council for Sustainability Sustainable Development Cement Sustainability Initiative, which was the first opportunity for the global cement sector uh, to get together to set um, sector wide. CO2 reduction targets, um, take a look at <clears throat> what practically could be done. And one, one of the longest lasting and continuing legacies of that initial effort was a program called Getting the Numbers Right. <clears throat> and it's an electronic database um, that provides full disclosure data from all the major economies around the world. <clears throat> and why, you know, why that's important is we would have one way of reporting uh, CO2 numbers in the U.S. The EU would have another approach. China would have a different approach, <clears throat> and it was an opportunity to bring, uh, bring, create a create a, a set of standards that could be shared across the globe, a single reporting methodology, and then a single database where that data could be contained. <clears throat> and today, that database is managed by the Global Cement and Concrete Association. Uh, it's accessible online. It's accessible to NGOs, analysts, uh, employees, <clears throat> prospective employees, anyone who has an interest in really taking a look at what the sector is doing, and then breaking it down more on a country uh, country level or a regional level. Um, and <clears throat> and all of that was done really with the with the spirit of having CO2 transparency. Um, being able to to do uh, what needs to be done to understand the risks for the sector, to understand the risk for the company, uh, to allow people to, <clears throat> to set targets, um, to show the trajectory that they were looking to achieve, whatever that was, that could be goals between today and 2022 or between today and 2050, and to be able to be articulate and share with investors, with employees, with shareholders, um, with financial institutions, exactly what we were doing and delivering as it related to performance against those goals. Um, so, so that's part part of the part of the uh, Lafarge Holson methodology. It was to take a leadership role, to be able to bring the sector together, to be able to get the numbers right, <clears throat> to be able to set clear targets, and to be able to deliver on those targets. And I'm happy to talk about that further uh, in the question and answer period. Thank you so much, Michael. Very helpful uh, overview, and we'll make sure we get back to that. And I also I really appreciate your opening story, right? Finding some silver linings during this uh, difficult time. So thank you so much. We're now going to proceed to some moderator questions uh, while we see questions populating in the question box as well, and we'll get to those. We have about 45 more minutes, so we'll try to get as to as many as possible. How I want to start is throughout the three presentations, there was a lot of discussion about opportunities, right? And that could sound odd when we're talking about something as serious as climate change. But I want to make sure our audience truly understands what opportunities those opportunities are and what it means. So I'm wondering if any of you, and this goes to all the panelists, uh, could speak more to what those opportunities are and how 
you're discovering opportunities that are beneficial both to your company, but also for the climate overall. And if anyone's trying to speak right now, uh, I think you're all on mute. We just need to unmute. Yes, Michael, go ahead. I'm still not hearing anyone. Sorry, I also had you on mute on my phone. So, yeah, so thank, sorry. thank you. Okay. I think it's a good <laughs> it's a good question for us to kick off with. So, so what? What I would say is when we talk about targets, and I think this is uh, it goes to some of the points that have been raised with the we're on a journey and this is part of a process. And for for Lafarge Holson, uh, we, we reached another uh, what, what I would call milestone within our uh, climate reduction journey, which is uh, <clears throat> in December of 2019, uh, we went through the process of evaluating our targets versus the uh, science based targets initiative um, and going through that process um, we had you know a third party validation that the targets we set were consistent with the two degree reduction scenario that was agreed to in cop 21 <clears throat> and uh, you know it really was a was a process for us that validated the path that we were on that the trajectory that we were on and it also gives us um, an opportunity to reset you know, as we look to the future in adjusting those targets so that we get to in line with the 1.5 degree scenario as well. <clears throat> and so that 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 for me was, uh, I think it's something we're sharing with the group that the science-based targets initiative, I think is, is going to be a very, uh, for me, it was a very significant milestone for us to, to have the targets validated, to have them go through that, uh, go through that rigorous process and to really, you know, it helps reinforce our commitment in the U.S. and our commitment uh, by the, biz the businesses that operate in the other 80 countries around the world that what we're doing is achieving the global goals, um, and, and we can see exactly how we contribute to those uh, from a country-specific basis. And Tom, this is this is Mackenzie. Um, so for us, you know, one of the key things that we have kind of taken away from you know this this focus on the transition to a lower carbon economy is you know how can we support companies that are thinking strategically about this transition and that are positioning themselves well to adapt to these trends and and one of the main mechanisms that we are able to do that is through our financing and so we really are aiming to expand our financing for, for those companies that are focused on that strategy and, and you know, that includes renewables and low carbon technologies and solutions. And we also recently announced the sustainable development financing target um, in February of 200 billion in 2020 that, that really builds on some previous commitments that we've made. But it's really around thinking through how can we leverage our expertise and our business to help our customers and clients transition and develop solutions that are sustainable and that contribute to facilitating that transition. All right, thank you. Uh, Sharon, you wanna take the, you wanna, you wanna answer that question? Yeah, I think, uh, I think the whole, um, idea about looking at it from opportunity um, aspect as well uh, is really key. And I, I think that was really key for our company um, in um, disclosing even more and going forward with um, reporting with that, with the TCFD framework. Um, as well as the more rigorous approach in reporting with the uh, um, CDP, uh, because we were already talking about what the opportunities are um, and how we were taking advantage of those opportunities. So, uh, you know, demand for electric vehicles and new uh, shared uh, transportation modes and um, renewable energy, all of these 
uh, elements were a part of our actions already. Um, so it became really clear that um, that, that was actually more important to talk about than just the risk uh, because it really provided uh, more clarity about the direction and the priorities of the company overall um, and actually is what led to uh, iterating our priorities um, through our vision of zero crashes, zero emissions, and zero congestion. So that I, I would offer that up. All right. Thank you all for those uh, insights and responses to that question. I think that's helpful. Um, so I wanted to take back take it back to TCFD um, during my opening presentation, and as we all know, kind of the the purpose here is to make sure we have more consistent uh, disclosures, so it's easy to compare companies and their disclosures uh, to one another, right? So all of you are leading in this space. Uh, so consistency is really important to show, you know, the great work that you're doing in disclosure, how you're considering these risks, risks, how you're looking at opportunities, and how that could benefit uh, the company moving forward. So I'm curious if if we've seen progress uh, in the last couple of years towards standardization, um, or if we're still a long way away. And if we're not there yet, what steps do we really need to take in the next couple of years to get on a path to, to more standardization? And that's open to, to anyone. Yeah, Tom, this is Mackenzie. Um, I would say that broadly speaking, I think, you know, we should remember that the TCFD has a five-year implementation timeline and that there are, there's a lot of learning going on. And so I think that compared to pre-TCFD, there's been a significant amount of increase, increased disclosure on this topic. And, you know, as people are, as companies are figuring out what makes sense and as people are actually figuring out the tools and the measurements for these types of risks, you know, I think, there's a balance between get being consistent and allowing for the flexibility of disclosure to around what is important to your business. And that was really what the TCFD sought to do, which was to provide a framework to kind of enhance that consistency, but allow that flexibility for companies to be able to talk about their business in the way that made sense for them. And I think that we've seen, you know, significant conversation around it and I think we're moving towards more consistency than we were several years ago but there's also you know this moment where we need to remember um, there's a lot of work going on to, to understand what information is actually being put out there right now and there's refinement and so you know I think we're in a bit of a period where that it's important to kind of let that flexibility play out. I agree with Mackenzie. This is Sharon. I, um, I, I think that we, uh, in a voluntary approach, and right now in this particular time frame, um, allowing for disclosures that best meet the needs of uh, the companies um, is uh, the way to go. I, I think we're we're getting uh, much more robust uh, disclosures as a result of it. Um, everybody is a different um, stage of maturity also on uh, some of this and um, uh, and and I think that right now that flexibility that Mackenzie indicated is really important for this to grow yeah, and this is Michael so I think one of you know I, I think what what you're hearing from from all of us is um, consistency is important, but there, <clears throat> but it's going to be an evolutionary process. Uh, one one of the things in in the Lafarge Wholesome evolution is <clears throat> I talked before that we've been talking about um, uh, climate risk and climate reduction goals uh, for two decades as part of our sustainability report <clears throat> for 2019. If you go and take a look at our 2019 full year. Um, <clears throat> um, Performance uh, that we that we issued at the uh, at our uh, uh, full year reporting, it was the first time we did an integrated report. <clears throat> so the financial results and sustainability were contained within 
and integrated reporting. Um, you know, I think it's uh, it's a little bit of the evolution um, that's expected from from our shareholders and our employees, uh, financial institutions and analysts. <laughs> so they you know they want to get all of it in the in the same spot. They also want to see how the overall company's performance and strategy is tied to those uh, climate goals. And I think if you take a look at the analysts that, uh, you know, that wrote and followed up, followed us after that uh, full year report, you know, there was a review of EBITDA and our performance against the, the, the uh, financial metrics, a discussion on free cash flow, but very quickly transitioned into their view on our CO2 targets, uh, whether they were aggressive enough and whether they were uh, appropriate enough and whether we had disclosed the, the necessary amount of risk and opportunity. So I think, you know, as you as you see, you know, kind of the climate disclosure um, and climate targets being much more of a sustainability goal in the past, I think that um, the evolution, uh, you know, and the evolution for us is that we're, we're doing that integrated reporting. We're putting it all in one place. Uh, we're making sure that our Sustainability goals are aligned with the business goals, and that they are one of the same. And I think that's a, that's a trend that you can expect to see grow um, and be utilized by uh, by hopefully by companies across the globe. Right. Thank you all. And and I I totally see and understand the importance of flexibility here and disclosures. Um, but of course, we also know the the timeline that we're on and the urgency that we face. So I'm curious. You know what tools or policy guidance or you know maybe it's investment in new digital technologies or tools or new innovations or partnerships do we really need to help the leaders continue to lead and go to the next level but also make sure that maybe small or, or medium-sized businesses or other companies that are just getting started have the resources they need to really uh, ramp this up as quickly as possible while also understanding flexibility and the learning that we still need to do. On this top, sorry, I don't know if you could hear me before. Um, one of the really great things that that happened in the last couple of years, um, following the the release of the TCFD recommendations, um, was that a lot of groups came together to try to tackle the recommendations. And so, what you're seeing, you know, one example of kind of this this um, coordination between, as you kind of suggested policymakers and and regulators and um, companies is in the in England in the UK with the there's a kind of a joint working group um, led by the Prudential Regulatory Authority um, and another group whose name is escaping me um, but they actually have a number of work streams designed to do exactly what you're saying which is there are a lot of companies that don't have the capacity or the ability to really ramp this up and so they're working to put out some guidelines for them on lessons learned from from others who have, who have the ability to kind of pilot some approaches. And so, um, you know, I think there's a lot of work going on in that space. And then a number of trade organizations around the world are taking this very seriously and, and providing and updating their own policy approaches towards climate. Um, often reflecting a lot of the spirit of the TCFD, but also just generally calling on companies to think about what policy solutions would be useful and 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 what um, mechanisms do we need to actually you know drive investment um, towards those solutions. And so I think you know I think there's a lot of that happening, um, and and that's what's been really great to see. You know I think a lot of especially the U.S. trade orgs are, are starting to move in that direction. I think organically we're starting to see a lot of convergence um, and the same uh, types of um, criteria um, in the various reporting frameworks. So, for instance, you know, CDP, uh, fully integrated um, disclosures um, based on TCFD recommendations. Um, I, I think that is just huge. Um, the other is, you know, we see 
uh, GRI really making clear how uh, those reporting standards map uh, to uh, the TCFD recommendations um, and a lot of uh, different workshops like that. And I, I think um, we're going to start seeing even more of that, possibly even through uh, the third-party investor rating and ranking assessments that are done um, for disclosures more in line and consistent um, across the way. So I, I think we're kind of organically seeing that happen right now. And from from Lafar Tolson's perspective, you know, I think <clears throat> I think what what I've articulated before on the call is that you know TCFD provides the framework, <clears throat> and the framework is uh, important um, because it's uh, it's helping to create a, a platform where we have um, comparable goals. So so for for our company, we've always had uh, clearly defined targets. We <clears throat> we have always um, shown progress, uh, not always meeting our targets, but showing the progress that we're making and clearly take a look at our performance versus those targets. And it's not set 2050 goals. We, we have to set uh, short and midterm goals um, that help keep us on the path to be able to achieve, <coughs> achieve the, uh, the science-based targets that, that, uh, you know, that we have uh, validated. So, so I think for me, the, the <clears throat> providing a framework, providing a platform, um, and maybe a little bit different being a, a European-based company that uh, you know, cl climate disclosure has been a risk and an opportunity that we've had to look at for quite a long time with respect to with respect to our uh, reporting of uh, performance of the business, as well as the, the risks of the business, and and we <clears throat> and we view that. Uh, the more consistency that we can have in that approach will help create the comparison, uh, not only not only for how we're doing on our own performance, but how uh, others in the sector are doing it to create a, a level playing field when you look across the uh, across the cement and concrete sector around the globe. Okay, thank you very much. And we're going to transition now to audience Q and A. I'm going to start with a, a couple of questions that I'm going to combine into one. And these are for all panelists, so feel free to uh, respond as you wish. So the first question comes from Karen, and it's that given that corporate sustainability disclosure is largely voluntary, are there any third-party certifications as to uh, evaluate the veracity of the information being disclosed? And then similarly, uh, Tim asked, do the panelists expect the TCFD framework to transition from a voluntary to a mandatory reporting requirement? Uh, presum presumably under the SEC reporting and disclosure rules. So we know there's been some movement towards this in other parts of the world, so feel free to touch on that. And there's a couple uh, pieces of legislation, both in the House and the Senate, that's looking at disclosure as well. So feel free to comment on, on any or all of those questions. Thank you. And if someone's speaking, we can't uh, we can't hear you. Okay. Uh, maybe we'll loop back around to that question. We can't hear folks right now. Uh, we'll proceed to the next I question. Can. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. I can, sorry. Um, this is Mackenzie. I you know I'll take the second one. I think that. Um, the TCSD is largely their recommendations. And so I do think that they will inform and influence um, other standard setting bodies as they start to tackle this question. So, you know, we're seeing a lot of this in Europe already where they've really taken um, a lot of this, this spirit into assessing the, like in the EU, they have the new taxonomy. There's also something called the non-financial reporting directive which seeks to align to the TCFD, but it also is aligning to a number of other standards, so GRI, SASB, um, et cetera. And so I do think that what TCFD created, while TCFD is not a, there's no, we like to say there's no TCFD police. Um, they're, they're not, you know, checking whether or not people have 
disclosed it according to their own recommendations and, and saying so there, um, it's more to just guide these decisions. And so I do think as we move forward, they will inform and just, you know, as um, Sharon mentioned, CDP, for instance, did take the recommendations and, and realign their, their questionnaires accordingly. So I think we'll be seeing more of that integration um, going forward. Yeah, so this is Michael. I'm gonna I'm gonna circle back to something I talked I talked about in my introduction, <clears throat> in that um, I think I think the science-based targets initiative uh, is something something for the uh, uh, for the attendees to to take a look at. You know, for for me when I look at uh, Lafarge Wholesome and how we set our objectives, it gave us the validation of the targets that we were looking for. Uh, so it showed uh, it showed what we thought. Um, we had were, were on a on a path to achieve uh, with respect to uh, setting our <clears throat> setting our short and midterm targets that we would be on the on a path that was consistent with uh, the two degree initiative and uh, you know I think that that uh, when I look about when I look at how do you sort through you know commitments that that companies make um, having a third party validated a science-based uh, target um, it is, uh, is something that uh, that you can actually take and and uh, and bank on when you're looking at you know what what does this goal mean this voluntary goal that the company set what does it mean and and what is it going to achieve so so I think that's uh, that for me is uh, something that I would encourage you to, if you are not familiar with it to take a look at it because it's uh, I think it's an important evolution in in disclosure reporting. This is Sharon. I, I want to just um, touch on the voluntary. You know, yeah, it is voluntary, but you know, from our company's standpoint, you know, we're a, a, happen to be in a sector that is now uh, the largest um, contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. So you have to kind of go back and say, you know, this is really material to our business and. Um, being open and transparent and disclosing this information is very important for us. Um, so whether it's uh, voluntary or not, um, I think entered in only on our approach that we weren't going to, you know, wait uh, in to uh, begin reporting um, or let that perfect get in the way in the way of the good. Instead, uh, phase this in over three years. Uh, with robust um, uh, improvements year over year. So that would be the voluntary part of it. But I think, you know, there are plenty of sectors out there that are big contributors and really need to um, consider that as well, um, regardless of whether it's voluntary or not. Great, thank you. Uh, moving to the next question, I'm going to again combine two that I feel like are both related to the evolution that all of your companies are going through, right? Where you start, kind of just, just get started, like uh, Sharon and McKenzie mentioned, to where you are now. The first comes from Giovanna, and it's how do you make your annual TCFD and SASB reporting relevant and new each year and not a rep rep repetition of the prior year's reporting? And then the second question comes from Lisa. And it's for Sharon and the other panelists as well. There are a number of disclosure programs with various scopes, which can be difficult to uh, understand at first glance. How do you communicate the value of each program and reconcile the different results? Thank you. It's Sharon. Uh, I'll uh, take that. Uh, the last one on uh, in terms of uh, all, all the frameworks and um, I, I see them as being complementary uh, to uh, all and certainly I see them also as having um, specific and um, at least at this point uh, perhaps uh, distinguished audiences so for instance SASB uh, very much um, investor focused um, GRI and those standards in terms of um, 
uh, our sustainability reporting a um, little broader in approach, um, covering more topics, a little different uh, uh, focus. Um, but I, I go back to, um, I, I kind of go back to where we look at, you know, what's expected of us, you know, would, um, if we put a value on disclosure and uh, transparency as a company, um, it, then uh, taking seriously um, the various frameworks and uh, how we impact um, in our communities and how things going on in the world impact our ability to create long-term value, um, they all play uh, together and interrelated, and we use that sort of lens in making the decisions on the framework and our approach um, in reporting. And this is Mackenzie on, I'll kind of tackle the first question broadly, but you know, when we approach our, our general reporting, so that includes our environmental, social, and governance report, as well as other disclosures like the TCFD, I think one of our kind of guiding thoughts is there are certain parts that, that arguably shouldn't change from year to year. So governance, for instance, I mean, I think there are improvements, but broadly, you know, there are certain mechanisms that I think you want to communicate are, are still in place and, and still working. And so that's where I think for us, the key in kind of building on our, um, reporting so in the context of TCFD you know our first report we really outlined a lot of next steps that we knew we needed to tackle some challenges we identified some of the challenges to doing so but I think you know going forward you want to identify places where you've made progress and significant wins and that's part of you know what I think I touched on in in my brief overview was a lot of times stakeholders are really interested in how you're going about thinking about these questions and so really disclosing the process and the progress um, in, in a lot of ways right now is, is just as important as coming up with the, the conclusion. Okay, great. Uh, moving to the next question here. Um, so there's been several questions coming up about policy and political activity. And of course, a big point here is that disclosure is an important part of the overall climate strategy that you have. And what matters is reducing emissions at the end of the day. So I'm curious how disclosure uh, fits into your larger climate strategy and how you're approaching hot topics like lobbying activity and policy advocacy, uh, which I saw listed in your presentation originally, Sharon. And of course, I welcome all participants to comment on, on those strategies. Tom, can you just repeat repeat that last part? Yeah, sure. So I was um, just speaking to here. I'll just do the whole question again in case people missed it. Um, so in, in the question and answer, in the questions here, we've seen a uh, several about policy and political activity. Uh, and of course, we know that disclosure is an important part of an overall strategy that you all have, not just the sole strategy, uh, because what matters is reducing emissions at the end, of the end of the day. So I'm just asking if you could comment a little bit more about how disclosure fits into this larger climate strategy and how you're approaching hot topics like political lobbying and policy advocacy and the people you're working with on those issues as well. I just mentioned you, Sharon, at the end because I saw in the most common ESG issues and focus. Uh, lobbying disclosure was coming up there as well. Yeah, so um, I, I think it, it all is uh, aligned with our vision, uh, particularly on uh, zero emissions, but I think it um, also uh, for the, I think it has to do with the consistency also, right? Uh, not only on what you report, but how you act and the actions that you're taking. Uh, to deliver on uh, these uh, commitments and goals and uh, focus areas. So it, um, it uh, really, uh, I, 
in my opinion, for our company, helps us stay aligned to uh, the vision of zero emissions and reporting, not just for reporting's sake. You know, it's um, we don't look at it that way. It isn't just about putting information out there. It's about um, disclosing and being transparent about how we're managing our business to deliver that value long term and over a period of time. And so when you when you look at what you're disclosing, how does that help the company perform better by putting a, a bigger lens on it uh, or a more focused look at it? Um, I, I think that uh what the the focus is and then everything um aligns with that so for instance you know in terms of lobbying and our um our focus on uh ev strategy you know goals about and um and and uh corporate strategy of uh evs like 20 by 2023 20, um, and uh, what it takes to get there and to build a market for EVs leads you to um, our lobbying for a national zero emission vehicle policy in the United States that um, leverages uh, all parties in building infrastructure and incentivization and uh, consumer um, interfaces uh, to help build that market. So um, those all align uh, in when you are focused on um, the disclosures that you're making in driving performance of the company. And yeah, this is Michael. So, um... For Lafar Tolson, you know, we, we believe that both climate leadership and climate policy advocacy is an essential element <clears throat> to corporate sustainability leadership. And <clears throat> we we are active followers of the uh, the tri triple A uh, policy that was uh, that was articulated by a number of leading uh, environmental uh, NGOs and other NGOs in, uh, in 2019. Which, which basically the AAA stands for that we need to advocate for policies that are consistent with achieving net zero emissions by 2050. Um, so, so we we aggressively uh, work to um, to uh, to sort of point our advocacy program in a direction that is consistent at both the state and the federal level uh, with that advocacy goal. That we work to align our trade associations. Um, for us in the U.S., um, our tr principal trade associations for uh, cement, concrete, and aggregates align those trade trade associations with that same goal of net zero emissions by 2050, and that we allocate um, our advocacy spending, so both our lobbying spending and as well as our political spending um, to adv advance those climate pr principles and not obstruct them. So. So for us, um, like I said up front, leadership and and uh, and climate policy advocacy are a central part of uh, of what uh, we do as Lafarge Wholesome in the U.S. and it's part of the the approach that we take um, pu publicly um, <clears throat> and and all of our public engagements with uh, with the elected officials and leaders and other NGOs on the on the topic of climate climate policy and uh, that includes disclosure and a whole host of other things. Thank you. Yeah, and, and this is McKinsey. So for us, you know, it's very similar. We work, you know, to we really think about um, these issues in the context of kind of where where are the solution opportunities. And, you know, we recognize, you know, businesses have a role to play, but but governments also do as well. And so, you know, throughout our kind of climate journey, you know, we long ago, we supported staying, you know, we supported the Paris Climate Agreement, we supported staying in the Paris Climate Agreement. Um, and then, you know, recently have been working to kind of support strong 
policy, climate policy ideas that really think about, you know, that are market-based and flexible and promote innovation and protect the most vulnerable. And so for that reason, you know, we, we came out recently and supported um, the Climate Leadership Council's roadmap plan for a carbon tax and dividend. But, you know, that's really broadly contextualized in this, you know, we support really effective climate policy proposals and, and work to engage um, with our trade associations and, and others on, on promoting and, and supporting and thinking through what those are. Right. Thank you so much. And I think that's becoming increasingly more important, right? Getting uh, more and more stakeholders focused on the policy dynamics. So it's great to hear about how all of you are engaging in those conversations constructively. Um, so I'm going to ask one more question here, which is kind of the elephant in the room. Uh, and then we're going to go to closing statements and then finish up right around 2.30. Um, so the next question, let's see, it came from someone. It came from Michael here. Do you anticipate corporations retracting from or delaying their carbon commitments in light of the economic dirt downturn due to COVID-19? Of course, this is a very uh, sensitive topic and we wanna make sure we approach it the right way while also remaining focused on the climate crisis as well. So thank you so much. Hey, Tom, I'll take that one first. Is that okay? Yes, please proceed. I think you might have just gone on uh, mute, though, Sharon. Sharon, I think we lost your audio. Hmm. Uh, Michael or Mackenzie, do you want to comment on this question while we wait for Sharon? Sure, I'm ha I'm happy to. So, so I, think, okay. I think it's a good question. It's good. It's a good question because uh, you know uh, co the coronavirus and the, the response um, has certainly dampened the U.S. economy and the global economy. <clears throat> but what what I would tell you is. Um, you know, just just 10 days ago, uh, our U.S. Executive Committee had um, three quarters of a day planning session that was looking at our sustainability program, including climate, um, our commitments, what we were planning to do, <clears throat> what we were planning to do across our manufacturing network, um, and really aligning that strategy with <clears throat> with goals that we have because we intend to be we intend to operate in the U.S. for another hundred years plus. Um, so you know, a a as bad as uh, as bad as the uh, the pandemic has been and what it's done to the economy, we we still need to plan for the future. So I see, yeah, yes, there is a there's a focus on getting through in the short term, but you know, we we plan we plan for a very long window horizon on the, for the business, and so our our climate uh, goals are going to be there a year from now they're going to be there two years from now they're going to be there 10 years from now and uh you know we're going to still we're going to still push in progress <clears throat> and i'm speaking again on behalf of our u.s business we're still in to push and, and show dem demonstrate progress and meet those commitments and adjust uh, you know adjust to what we need to do to be on target with our science-based targets so so yes, a bump in the road, but but it's not going to change the strategy, and I and I doubt that you're going to hear anyone else say it's going to change the overall strategy for their companies because we're in for the the long haul on this topic. Yeah, and I would just echo that and say that broadly, you know, I think companies are still very focused on sustainability and and achieving their commitments and and are working hard to do so. All right. Thank you so much. Um, we're trying to get Sharon back. Unfortunately, we lost her audio. Um, but with that, I'm going to ask each of our panelists to provide some quick final remarks on key takeaways, next steps, or anything else that they'd like to leave the audience with. To give them a few seconds to gather their thoughts, I'd like to first thank each of our speakers for taking the time to participate in the webinar today. Thank you as well to our audience for your participation and attention, of course, for your thoughtful questions as well. We do apologize we couldn't get to them all. Uh, but we welcome a continuing conversation on this important topic. So with that, I'm going to hand it back to, it looks like Sharon's back on. So Sharon, do you want to 
comment on that last question and then also provide uh, some final remarks. And I apologize for putting you on the spot as you just got back in. I totally forgot the question in my frantic attempt to figure <laughs> out what happened. <laughs> That's okay. It was just a question about how how uh, companies are responding to COVID-19 and uh, potential impact on climate commitments. And then I just asked for basically any final takeaways uh, that you'd like to leave the audience with. Uh, well, I'll do both. Um, I, you know, in terms of our company, um, it has not taken our eye off the ball on uh, areas of the business um, very much in, involving our climate impacts and uh, managing those. So um, priority programs like our electric vehicles and our ability to meet a goal of 20 more uh EVs by 2023 um, is in place and all available resources still focused on that, uh, while other uh, programs may be impacted, um, those really uh, remain the focus because those really are the lifeblood of the company uh, long term. And I think um, uh, right now is the time for companies to think about long term uh, rather than uh, the short term uh, reaction uh, to the pandemic facing all of us. Certainly a big impact. Um, and in terms of final thoughts, um, I, I would um, um, I, I just encourage companies to just kind of, you know, keep going at it. Uh, in terms of disclosing, find out what are the most uh, most important impacts that you have um, or the largest impacts focus efforts there in terms of how you talk about that publicly in your reporting uh, and the types of data that you disclose to indicate progress. Um, and um, and uh, and it'll it'll come um, as uh, more and more focus uh, gets placed uh, in in this area. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, Mackenzie. Yeah, thank you, Tom. And I, I would just say, you know, I think for us and and for companies out there that are are tackling this, I think engagement just remains to one of the most important pieces of this puzzle, which is talking to really anyone and everyone, you know, those that think you're doing a great job, those that think you're not doing enough, you learn a lot from those conversations. And it's always valuable to, to kind of learn how you can improve or know what people, you know, think is, is, is on the right track. And, you know, so I just encourage folks to do that both internally and externally, it really was something that we took away from our process as um, a key a key relationship builder and, and that is making our strategy stronger. Thank you, Mackenzie. And Michael, you get the final word. Yep. So so thank you. Um, you know, what I would say from a from Lafar Tolson's perspective is uh, to continue to expect more from our company as it relates to uh, climate disclosure. <clears throat> you know, we've seen a we've seen a tremendous amount of work that's been done. Um, in the short term, on aligning our goals with uh, the science-based targets initiative, uh, I continue to I, I expect that <clears throat> that there'll be announcements this year on how we adjust to the to the uh, the new targets and what that means for our business around the globe. And the last thing I would say is um, I, I see more and more uh, companies that that have taken targets without a plan. So it's the aspirational target of we're going to be carbon neutral by 2050, but no plan, um, no ability to really show interim targets, no ability to demonstrate performance over time, no ability to show that trajectory. So, so I think if if uh, if you are part of a group that really wants to set targets, you really need to you really need to spend some time and articulate that plan. Because I think you're going to see more and more from the investment community and from financial institutions calling out um, those that have what I would call, you know, kind of fake fake targets that they've uh, that they've created because they think they need to have one. And so, so for me, that's uh, you know, that's kind of a takeaway for for the group is, you know, have a good plan, have some good targets, have the ability to deliver, be able to track your performance, 
do it in do it in a science based way and create create the the platform to articulate uh, what you're doing if you're accomplishing or in the case if you're missing targets that you miss the targets and and have a plan on how to catch up so for for Lafarge yeah. Holson, like I said you know expect expect uh, expect some great things from us uh, going forward and uh, I look forward to continuing this conversation thank you Michael that concludes our webinar make sure to continue the conversation by following and tweeting at us at c2es underscore org on Twitter from the entire c2es team we wish you safety and good health take care and goodbye for now